Okay, I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier chair here at CSIS. Uh, we're here to talk about, uh, the re we're doing a launching a report on innovation ecosystems. The longer name, the title of the report is Transformative Innovation for International Development. But specifically today, we're going to be talking about the section of the, re the new report, which is about operationalizing innovation ecosystems. Uh, the report is, as you'll note, is a report that was supported with our friends at uh, JICA, the Japanese aid agency, the JICA Research Institute. I'm really pleased that Dr. Katano has come all the way from Japan to be with us. He's the director of the JICA Research Institute. Please welcome him. I also want to recognize Hasono Sensei, Dr. Hasono, who's here as well. He's the former director of the JICA Research Institute and a senior statesman in international development. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. We're very grateful for our partnership with the JICA Research Institute. And I think the work we've been doing is relevant not only to J Japanese cooperation and American cooperation, but also to our partner countries, as well as to both the Japanese private sector and to the American private sector. So, I think you'll find this conversation very interesting today. Um, our friends at JICA Research Institute about a year ago said, there's this thing called Fab Labs. And I did not know what a Fab Lab was. And many of you in this audience will know what a Fab Lab is. I had no idea what a Fab Lab was. And they said, well, we need to understand, you need to understand that there's this new revolution in technology coming, and it's going to impact development. And one of the ways it's going to impact development is through things like Fab Labs, but not only Fab Labs. Um, and there have been a series of interesting books that we reference in the report. There's Klaus Schwab's Fourth Industrial Revolution. And then there's a book by Alec Ross called The Industries of Tomorrow that I think are good for non-technical people, uh, good summations of some of this, that, of what's coming and what it means. But I, and I think this report is a good first stab at beginning a longer conversation about what is this revolution, this revolutionary technology that's going to change the developed world, what's it going to mean for opportunities and challenges for the developing world? And what's it going to mean for development cooperation? I think it has a, there are a whole series of questions that we don't answer completely in this report, but I think we're, this is the first, I think, of many, you'll see many reports like this over the next five years. Uh, but I think, um, I think it's, it's great that we're so pleased we're doing this with JICA Research Center. I want to thank, in particular, the principal author, Helen Moser, who's in the back. So uh, I think she did a really excellent job on writing this report and working in partnership with J uh, Japan, our Japanese colleagues, uh, to do a report that I think both institutions are very, very pleased with. So um, we've got a lot of thoughtful people. We've got some, you've got their biographies in front of them. I'm going to first invite Dr. Joseph Rieger from, from Fujitsu, but it's via Germany, who is uh, the chief technology officer for Ch Fujitsu's <coughs> Europe, Middle East, India, and Africa, who's going who's to make some, some initial remarks. So please come on up, Dr. Rieger. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joseph Rieger. I'm the chief technology officer of Fujitsu in Europe, Middle East, India, and Africa. And I'd like to thank you, Dan, and thank the CSIS organization for inviting us. It's a, uh, a great honor for Fujitsu and for me in, uh, in particular uh, to be here at the launch of this uh, report. The title is Transformative Innovation for International Development, somewhat shaded by the menu system of Microsoft Windows, interestingly. <laughs> Technology <laughs> is great <laughs> and revolutionary <laughs> when it works. <laughs> Right, and this is an excellent piece of work, and I'd like to have a couple of remarks. Uh, you need to read it, so I'm not going to give you a, a, a short uh, a recap of what's in the uh, report, but I'd like to make a, a couple of remarks uh, about it. And uh, maybe that helps uh, you to understand why Fujitsu is not just interested, but also very much engaged uh, uh, in these activities. As an opening statement, I'd like to say and go on record with it uh, uh, that there has never been a better time to do innovation and create e innovation ecosystems than now. And uh, there are reasons for that. There's been nev never a better time to do innovation because we have, in terms of technology, a confluence of technologies that, that, came, that came together 
And I'd like to mention in particular the mobile technologies and I'd like to mention the cloud computing technologies that uh, redefine how we use infrastructure and information technology. And with that, innovation is a different process than what it used to be. Because just a couple of years ago, innovation processes and innovation projects in particular were hampered by innovation, information technology. You had to wait for IT to implement anything. This has dramatically changed. Instead of months, we can provision now all kinds of information technology support in hours. And therefore, a good idea, a good business idea that needs to have an implementation can be done in a matter of hours. So IT and ICT, information communication technologies, have become not so much uh, of a limiting factor. They are actually now an uh, agent of change and a, an accelerator for this. For the innovation ecosystems, though, uh, there are other technologies that play a role, and they came about with the advent of the internet. And the internet is now over 45 years old. It's amazing. Believe it or not. And the internet and the second generation internet, the mobile internet, and the third generation internet now, that is the internet of things, have all contributed to a very easy way of collaborating and creating ecosystem across borders of countries, uh, uh, nations, uh, uh, groups of all kinds, and therefore e ecosystems are much easier to create than uh, that they used to be. So there is an instantaneous and commercial grade IT and communication support for any kind of innovation uh, activity, in particular for innovation uh, ecosystems. What we still need to do is a proper financial model and financial support in the world to help uh, all these ecosystems to, uh, um, uh, to be created. I brought you uh, an example from Europe uh, where I live uh, and the European Union, and in particular European Commission, is very keen on about uh, creating uh, ecosystems. And they figured, and that might be a particular European or a particular EU way of doing things, that they figured that pressure will be good if uh, we would like to create ecosystems. So the European Union has a gigantic research uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, support program called Horizon 2020. This is when we imagine how the world should, uh, uh, should look like uh, in 2020. That's at the end of the decade. And there's a huge research uh, support program uh, created for that uh, that will be handing out 70 billion euro, that's about 70 billion dollars these days, uh, uh, in uh, research funds. And the way it's done is, is designed to create ecosystems because the probability that anyone who is applying will be getting support is much higher if three or more countries are involved in a consortium. If university and industrial research is teaming up, and it gets even better if there's a business engaged in that very same model. And with that kind of financial incentive, and that the probability for getting the fund, uh, uh, what we uh, have achieved is that there are e uh, innovation ecosystems uh, uh, being created across uh, Europe. Now, that's one thing that where the financial uh, incentives uh, do help. Now, I would like to also point out that there is a very particular time in the development of technology and therefore in the development of mankind today, and that is that we are living in the days of digital transformation. The digital transformation is a consequence of the technologies that I just listed, internet, mobile, internet, internet of things, and it's a particular mixture of business and information technologies, BT and IT. And if the two come together, then a totally new situation is created because now digital innovation can penetrate all aspects of life, all business processes, and it can change the fundamentals of any business because it redefines the value creation and the value chain. And uh, in terms of innovation ecosystems, what it means that there will be longer value chains with a lot more docking points in those value chains so that companies, suppliers, partners, and customers can dock in into the value chain and create entirely new opportunities. The digital transformation is transformative, transformative innovation in the report, 
in the sense that it can change the entire world. In fact, it can knock out entire industries by, uh, by changing their uh, uh, business models. And because of that, there is a danger here. And in Fujitsu's opinion, we need to, be, we need to progress. We need to do more than what we used to do, but we, do we need to do that with caution. Therefore, and this is why we are interested and supportive all, of all these efforts, from the Fujitsu perspective, our corporate goal that we have defined for ourselves is to create the human-centric intelligence society. What that means is a society that is more livable, more comfortable, more prosperous, and more sustainable. Now, if you go through the report, uh, you will see a lot of uh, examples, explicit or implicit, mentioned where prosperity, sustainability, uh, uh, comfortable life in developing countries, in uh, uh, international development, play an important role. So our corporate theme and motto plays very well uh, with, uh, with the ideas uh, described uh, in the report. But Jesus has worked on a methodology how to progress, and that methodology is called human-centric innovation. Human-centric innovation is like any other innovation from any other companies. It, do, it deals with the dimensions of innovation. It deals with the information part of it, with the infrastructure part of it that's vital. But it adds a very unique element uh, uh, that we uh, think in general uh, uh, in Japan, uh, every company, in particular Fujitsu, thinks it's important, and that's the people aspect. Human-centric innovation means, if I can steal just uh, uh, four words from the Gettysburg uh, Address of President Lincoln, it is an inf innovation for the people, by the people. The important thing, we are not doing this just, just for the people to make their lives better in developing uh, countries. We do that, for sure. But it is with the involvement of the people. We need technologies, we need innovation, and innovation ecosystems that involve the people in any country that we work in. Whether it's a small country or large, whether it's a rich country or poor. It needs to involve everybody. And because of that, we, and I, I do have a, a bunch of proof points of, of Fujitsu uh, projects that uh, we conduct around the world. And I'm, I'm not, uh, in interest of time, I'm not going to uh, go through them. I'd just like to emphasize that the work that we do in Singapore has very uh, uh, strong elements of sustainable urbanization in a country where uh, uh, the financial uh, funding of it is not really a problem. But we do work in other countries where the financial funding of any activities like that, like Myanmar and others, where the financial funding is a big problem. Uh, innovation ecosystems are created if there are four factors. The one is human capital needs to be available, financial capital needs to be available, and infrastructure that's today most by and large information and communication technology infrastructure, and there needs to be a right policy in place. These are things that we can influence, these are things that we can work on in our projects, and the infrastructure is best created. You will uh, excuse me as a, a representative of an IT company. Uh, I have to say that this happens best if it's left to the IT companies because uh, <laughs> they have experienced and they know what to do about. But we do work in Europe, in Barcelona, where we have created a smart city. We work in Japan, in, uh, in fab labs and, and tech shops, and we have an open innovation gateway here in the United States in Silicon Valley, where our laboratories directly work through a gateway approach, open innovation, opening up the innovation process from the idea creation till uh, uh, including uh, the um, uh, implementation of the whole idea. So the notion of the innovation ecosystems does play well with our corporate philosophy, with our corporate goals, and also with the methodology of human-centric uh, innovation. We do this because we conduct uh, something uh, that we call responsible business. That's not quite the same as corporate social responsibility. Responsible business is uh, our way to do the business in the right way. That doesn't mean that we don't want to uh, make profit with it. We do think that the responsible business is about how to make profit by doing the right things. 
and not so much about how to spend the money that you made, uh, um, possibly not always doing the right things. So uh, uh, we are very keen on this. This is a very Japanese and very Fujitsu-like corporate uh, uh, policy, and uh, we are very serious about it. So in closing, I'd just like to say that uh, 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 this is a tremendous report, a tremendous activity. We are very proud, and thank you for inviting us. And I opened up uh, by saying that uh, there's never been a better time to do innovation and create eco innovation ecosystems than today. And you might ask yourself, what is he going to say in five years from now if he is uh, given the opportunity to stand here? Well, he will probably say exactly the same. Uh, in five years, uh, it will be still true that there's never been a better time because there is progress. But the point is, ladies and gentlemen, that we have enough technologies, we have enough engagement, we have enough bright people so that we can do amazing things now. There is nothing we have to wait for, so there is no excuse. We need to push hard on creating innovation ec ecosystems around the world, in particular in developing countries. And I know, and I heard it many times, that uh, 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 some people respond, but surely water and food are more come first in these developing uh, in countries. They do, because they are more urgent. But innovation ecosystems are quite possibly more important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Thank Rubin. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to call up my friend and colleague, Dr. Katana, who's the director of the JICA Research Institute. Please come on up. Thank you, Dr. Katana. So good afternoon. Uh, I thank you all for participating in today's event. And I will share some of the highlights from the innovation ecosystem chapter of our joint CSIS JICA uh, Research Institute uh, report, Transformative Innovation for International Development. So this report was a result of a year of excellent partnership uh, between our two institutions. Uh, recent history has been uh, has seen the emergence of new industries and exploding technologies that are transforming the world and also changing the context for international development. Transformative innovation is a system level innovation that shifts the existing system toward a totally new and sustainable way uh, of uh, operating. So importantly, uh, transformative innovation approaches can enable a new path to prosperity in developing countries. So one notable uh, example of transformative innovation is, although uh, this is not the, in this report, uh, however, the development for sustainable agriculture, Brazilian Cerrado, which my colleague Dr. Hosono uh, presented yesterday in, here in CSIS. So beginning in the 1970s, Brazil, together with Japan, transformed the tropical savanna of Brazil, called the Cerrado, in just a quarter of a century into one of the world's most well-known grain-growing regions through establishing joint venture agricultural development company and sending agriculture experts to the Brazilian Agricultural Research Corporation, Embrapa, uh, which is the leading uh, institute for agricultural innovation. I just skip here and our report reviews notable innovation ecosystems in the US and Japan, as well as efforts by these countries to incorporate innovative uh, approaches to development in their foreign assistance and support innovation ecosystems in developing contexts. So in the US, Boston is a leading global center of innovation and economic uh, dynamism because of the symbiotic innovation ecosystem that brings talent, money, and ideas in proxi <coughs> proximity to uh, empower visionary uh, entrepreneurs 
like the Cambridge Innovation Center shown in this slide we visited uh, with uh, uh, Dan. And in Japan, Tsukuba uh, is Japan's largest base for science and technologies with uh, 32 national research and educational institutions, over 300 private research institutions and companies. Next, our report explores how uh, fabrication laboratories have the potential to serve as catalytic inputs for constructing and connecting new innovation ecosystems in the developing world. Fabrication laboratories, uh, or FABLA, uh, are technical prototyping platforms for innovation and invention, providing stimulus for local entrepreneurship. The basic idea is that a user can enter a fab lab with nothing and exit having made almost anything. Fab lab must first be open for public use. Second, include a specific set of machines, including 3D printers and laser cutters and that support open innovation. And finally, have the ability to connect with the global network of fab labs. So, Fab Labs, just one single Fab Labs, a very tiny, you know, kind of effort for innovation, local innovation, however, so networking of, you know, uh, uh, Fab Labs globally uh, will, you know, uh, generate the power uh, to change the uh, innovation ecosystems. And uh, Professor uh, Gashin Fell of MIT uh, is the father of Fab Labs. With assistance from the US National Science Foundation, a Fab Lab project was developed in 2002, setting up uh, venues around the world to promote personal fabrication. The first Fab Labs were established in the United States, India, Costa Rica, Norway, and Ghana. And so far, there are over 600 Fab Labs in about 90 countries. Even in my hometown, Mitaka, Tokyo, a recently established fab space. Because the uh, development of fab labs is still in its early stages, uh, so Joseph, uh, in his speech, uh, touched upon the financial aspects of ecosystems. So in the case of Fab Lab, many Fab Labs are still preliminarily dependent on financial support from either public funding or private donations. So Fab Labs can serve as a public good with return on investment for funders uh, experienced in the form of beneficiaries, uh, integration into the innovation ecosystem, and the positive spillover effects for local communities. However, uh, some Fab Labs provide technical uh, guidance uh, and training to users for fee generating income. So Fab Lab in Kamakura, Japan, uh, it's an old you know, kind of city in Japan, uh, shown in this slide, represent the most advanced existing model. So we need to get into this uh, Fab Lab, need to you know, take our shoes off, so very traditional kind of uh, Fab Lab in Japan. Uh, Key uh, researchers uh, in the Fab Lab movement have suggested four stages uh, for fa Fab Lab's development demonstrated in this fig figure. So this figure shows uh, there may be a development path for Fab Labs to secure financial sustainability beyond government and donor funds. Next, I will talk about some specific aspects of Fab Labs in the international development context. Fab Labs cannot solve every problem in low-income areas, but they can be a vehicle to catalyzing and strengthening innovation ecosystems. So they enable a custom approach to local challenges that reflect ideals, design, and needs of their markets. So they can be a transformative tool for developing local industry, advancing entrepreneurship, and increasing interest in STEM education, like uh, uh, shown uh, in this uh, slides. Momentum around them is increasing. So specific, specific recent international development efforts that have involved 
uh, Fab Labs include World Bank projects in Georgia and Bangladesh, and the JICA and SOLIDWORKS supported Fab Lab in Rwanda just opened last month, shown in the slide. Now, I will uh, talk about the case study that we undertook to consider the how of operationalizing Fab Labs in the Philippines. We first consider the existing innovation ecosystem in the Philippines to determine how Fab Labs could play a role. So why the Philippines uh, remain weak, such as uh, rural areas are missing some or all impetus to innovation, and innovation enabling platforms operate on a small scale and reach a limited audience. So this is a photo of the uh, Fab Lab Boho, which opened in 2014 at Boho Island State University, or BISU. It is the first Fab Lab in the Philippines. Uh, this uh, Fab Lab was initiated by a Japanese volunteer who stayed in Boho and cre created, eventually created this uh, Fab Lab. So Fab Lab Boho was created with a primary focus on improving the productivity and competitiveness of SMEs in Boho. It is a public space that offers tools and processes for open innovation, and it hosts free regular workshops and courses. Uh, upon play a uh, modest fee for operation uh, of the uh, selected machines and uh, provided with materials uh, free of charge. Fab Lab Boho receives its primary ongoing funding support from BISU and is also supported by JICA and the government of the Philippines. This photo shows a selection of products made in Fab Lab Boho. Fab Lab Boho is strengthening some of the uh, crucial elements of the innovation ecosystem in Boho. It has made positive steps to engage the local community as innovators and connect them with a global community. The Fab Lab is increasing the capacity of local firms and individuals to activity, uh, actively innovate. And following the positive outcomes of Fab Lab Boho, the government of the Philippines had decided to set up 10 Fab Labs nationwide uh, this year. Moreover, some universities are seeking to establish their own Fab Labs. So an example of the positive community impact created by Fab Lab Boho is its program to create affordable uh, prosthetic legs for uh, amputees. There are many amputees in the Philippines, but most of them are not able to get a prosthetic leg due to high costs. A team at Fab Lab Boho designed an affordable prosthetic leg by scanning an amputee's working leg and modeling the opposite missing leg with 3D software. The design data is transmitted to a specialized 3D printer which prints it with soft material. And the resulting 3D printed uh, prosthetic leg is much cheaper than a conventional prosthesis. One important thing to note is that the parts of this specialized printer can be obtained in local markets, ensuring the sustainability of this approach. Fab Lab Hall's primary challenge is uh, that other Fab Labs can learn from uh, financial sustainability and its ability to broadly reach the local community. So now let me touch upon some of our recommendations. First, uh, developing country governments, these governments can conduct uh, mapping exercises of local innovation ecosystems, support public pro provision of technical, technological goods and platforms for innovation, and pursue a combination of approaches that target high yield economic growth and train local citizens in entrepreneurship. Next, uh, bilateral donors and multilateral organizations these actors can support more private sector approaches to transformative innovation, including uh, tiered financing and providing funding for results.
And next are universities and NGOs and uh, uh, research organizations. Uh, these actors can encourage researchers and participants uh, in innovation, include, uh, enabling platforms to develop uh, innovations uh, that uh, respond to the specific local needs and development challenges and pursue joint research between innovators in a developing country and innovators in a developed country. Finally, I will conclude with some key take takeaways for building innovation ecosystems in developing contexts. First, in developing contexts, one or all of the inputs to innovation may be missing from an ecosystem. So, or an actor may not have the requisite capacity to support innovation. So mapping of a local innovation ecosystem uh, is an essential exercise to determine gaps and how best to fit them, fill them. And next, bilateral donors and multilateral organizations can then serve as catalysts for responses with a long-term goal of enabling local governments to implement and scale uh, innovation ecosystem building efforts themselves. Finally, uh, FabLabs are uh, one option uh, to catalyze and strengthen innovation ecosystems in developing contexts. So thank you, and I hope you will read the report which is available uh, here today and also in the uh, CSIS website. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katana-san. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to note one of the things that Katana said, said which the Bull Hall Fab Lab was set up by a Japanese volunteer, which Japanese volunteer specifically is like it's the equivalent of the Peace Corps, if I'm not mistaken. It was, it was someone who was a volunteer, the equivalent of the U.S. Peace Corps system of a young person going and saying, there's this thing called a Fab Lab, and let me help you put it together. And that it brought in the... JICA, you, you were able to bring, the, he was sort of, he or she was the vector that brought in a bunch of other actors to the conversation, but it, would, it started with a partnership with a Japanese volunteer, which I think is a very interesting component to this. So thank you very much, Katano-san. Um, let's go to my friend Ann Mae Cheng. Thanks for being here. Thank you. You're the Chief Innovation Officer and the Executive Director of the U.S. Global Development Lab at USAID. You had past lives at Apple. You had a past lives at Google. And we asked, I asked you this earlier, but I want to ask you this again. So you, you worked on both the Apple iPhone and you also worked on Google phones. Which ones do you own? <laughs> well, I told you earlier, I have both of them right now. You're very <laughs> diplomatic. You're very <laughs> good. Favorites. You definitely, you should, you know, that is, this is very good. You re it's excellent. It's excellent. Well, thanks for being here. I think you have one of the most interesting jobs in development. And I'm thrilled you would take time out of your schedule to be with us. My pleasure. Um, do we have my slides? Yeah. Just sit right? Great. Uh oh. Yeah, okay. Right. So, good afternoon. And I'm really honored to be here to talk about this topic of transformative innovation for international development, which is something that is really what we at the lab are all about. Um, first, I want to congratulate CSIS and JICA for this really important report that helps shine a light on this important topic. And I'm pleased to say that at the Global Development Lab, we are already very well aligned with the recommendations of the report and very supportive of them. And we're proud to have some of our work even featured in the report. Um, so I just want to give a very quick overview of what the lab is about and our approach to development and innovation. Our goal at the lab is to bring modern tools and approaches to the practice of global development for the purpose of reaching our overall goals better, faster, cheaper, and more sustainably. We call this new model of development 21st century development. It means being more open, more agile, more data-driven, and more sustainable. I was telling Dan earlier that I spent 23 years working in Silicon Valley, and what I think a lot of people, when they think about Silicon Valley and development, they think about the technologies that are developed in Silicon Valley and how that can be leveraged for development. What I believe is that what's even more valuable is the approach to innovation, and so that's what I want to focus on today. So 
what do I mean by 21st century development? It starts out through open innovation, by being much more open to new ideas, because we believe that by tapping into the ingenuity of people around the world, we will get the best solutions, and that the best solutions often come from unexpected places and from bringing diverse minds and perspectives together. Secondly, once we have that idea, that's only 1% of the solution. I, any idea, as good as it might be initially, needs to be refined. And that's where data and iteration comes in. That we believe we want to get data fast, that tells us what's working and what's not, and be able to drop, use it to drive rapid feedback loops to continue to improve our products. Third, we seek rigorous evidence through RCTs and other techniques to really understand what works and what doesn't that in achieving the outcomes we're looking for. And finally, serving tens or hundreds of thousands of people is important. But we believe that we need to serve tens or hundreds of millions of people. In order to do so, we need to ensure solutions have a financially sustainable path to reach massive scale. Because one thing we know for sure, as a grant maker, is that grant funding will always end. But we want solutions to live on. Mm. So the CSIS report makes two valuable recommendations for donors that um, were discussed earlier around building innovation ecosystems and developing contexts. The first recommendation is around supporting more private sector approaches to transformative innovation. And we know from experience that donor support and funding can be catalytic in helping seed stage ventures get off the ground and get to a point where private sector funding can come in. So we've taken a page out of the book from venture capitalists and are structuring our innovation funding along similar lines where we give many small seed stage grants to high risk early stage enterprises and then tear up our funding over time based on evidence and performance. We do this through several different mechanisms. One is DIV, or our Development Innovation Ventures, which is our flagship um, open innovation product. Um, we now have the Global Innovation Fund, which was spun out of USAID and in conjunction with partners such as DFID, Amidiar, and CETA. Um, and we have our grand challenges for development. All of these are open calls with a low barrier to entry. Let me give you a couple examples of what's come out of this. So one um, that came out of our grand challenges, um, a grand challenge for securing water for food, is a uh, social enterprise called Real Gardening. This has come up with by a 17-year-old woman in South Africa who found that when she was um, trying to plant seed vegetables in her garden, she was getting very low yield and using a lot of water in a, in a very drought-prone area. So she came up with this, this idea of these seed strips that, showed, that had seeds and organic fertilizer encased in these um, paper strips that showed you how deep to plant the seeds, how wide to space them apart, and indicated where the seeds were so you could save water when you watered them. She's now um, been able to scale her business through funding from DIV to reach over 300,000 households. Another example um, that we've also funded through DIV is called Off-Grid Electric. And Off-Grid Electric is bringing solar power, power to rural people in Tanzania. They've been able to do this by using mobile money to develop a pay-as-you-go business model so that customers can pay off their home solar system over time at just a few cents a day using mobile money. What this means is that Off-Grid is able to make a profit and then they can pro plow those profits back into their business so they can serve more customers. And here, I'm really proud to say our funding's been incredibly catalytic. We gave them a 100,000 grant initially to test out this idea, a million dollar grant later to, as they showed that the idea was promising to build up their infrastructure, and just a few months ago, a $5 million grant to really help them scale and expand. But what's more exciting is, aside from our six million or so dollars, they've been able to off that raise almost $100 million in private sector debt and equity. And what that means is that they are you know, getting the private sector support to take them forward and really continue to expand. They've now lit over 100,000 homes and are aiming to reach a million by the end of next year. So the second recommendation of the report is for donors to really serve as a catalyst for innovation enabling programs. 
So within the lab, when it comes to supporting uh, innovation and entrepreneurs, we take a three-pronged approach. The first, which I just described, is investing in individual social entre enterprises and social entrepreneurs. The second is partnering with investors and intermediaries to build, a thrive, to build thriving entrepreneurial ecosystems. And the third is investing in research that helps us better understand what's working and not in the work that we're doing in these ecosystems. So for the second area, we have our pa a program called PACE, which stands for Partnering to Accelerate Entrepreneurship. This initiative works with over 20 incubators, accelerators, and seed stage impact investors to catalyze private sector investment and to foster entrepreneurship. These partnerships are expected to leverage $61 million in combined public and private investments over the next five years. To give an example of what PACE does, one of the PACE grantees is Village Capital. And Village Capital has come up with a proven model to find, vet, and fund high potential early state enterprises use, using a peer selection model that's been proven to work better and yield better results for both entrepreneurs and investors. And so by partnering with Village Capital, we've been able to team up to build an investment fund that can attract private capital from both impact investors and conventional investors by offsetting some of the higher management costs through PACE. So we're, we're buying down the management costs to make it fit the profile that investors would normally look for, and then they're able to invest in this vehicle as they would any other investment. An example of the third um, area we talked about, which is research, is um, a new initiative called GALI, or the Global Accelerator Learning Initiative, which is led by Andy and Emory University, in which we're partnering with Amidyar Network, Lemelson Foundation, or Gideas Foundation to fund. As you've heard, there are many, many accelerators out there. Now there's more and more fab labs out there. This has become a very common intervention in development. The problem is, we don't know if they work. We have no idea if accelerators are actually accelerating anything. We just know that we're building a lot of them. And so what we're trying to do with Golly is to really figure out what works and what doesn't, what aspects of accelerators work and don't, so that we can make these investments uh, more intelligently. So as a result of the first GALI report that's come out, we've already learned a few things that were a little surprising to us. So one was the number of applicants to a program was inversely associated with success. A little counterintuitive. The lesson is that more narrowly targeted programs, for example, that are just targeting a specific sector, may attract fewer applicants, but ultimately add more value because of their focus. The second learning is that the amount of structured classroom content was also inversely associated with success. And the lesson there is that accelerators shouldn't focus so much on packing in structured lessons and programming, that that actually isn't the thing that helps people the most. That it may make more sense to take a flipped classroom approach, and it is this networking and mentorship and support that is actually more valuable to entrepreneurs. So those are just a few examples of some of the investments we're making with innovators in the innovation ecosystem and um, on research on these topics. Very excited to be here and looking forward to this discussion. We believe that the world has really signed on for an, this audacious goal to end extreme poverty by 2030. And I believe the only way we're going to get there is through transformative innovation because our existing tools and our existing funds just aren't enough. And so I'm really excited to be here with all of you today and really driving forward um, together to figure out how we're going to apply innovation to the problems of global development. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Great. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Takeyuki Morita, who's Executive Vice President and Chief Global Officer for the NEC Corporation, to make some remarks. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the introduction. And I'm uh, very pleased to be here and uh, part of the uh, members for the discussing uh, this exciting the, uh, themes, uh, transformative information for uh, uh, international development. I think uh, I want to talk about in a little bit broader sense because uh, uh, I understand that you talked about the smart city yesterday and uh, uh, now we are talking about uh, innovation ecosystem. 
but uh, for me, it sounds like uh, we are talking uh, two things uh, really, really connected each other. Um, uh, let me share and how the uh, uh, old electric Japanese company is really changing its uh, way of thinking. And the uh, NEC's uh, cradle, NEC is an ICD company with uh, 116 years uh, history. And uh, NEC is one of the company uh, announced the uh, computer and the communication concept. And that was the NEC corporate credo and a long time ago. But now, uh, look at these pictures. And uh, we never talk about uh, technology here. We are talking about sustainable earth and uh, safer city and the public services and the true quality of life. And mm. our credo is orchestrating a bright world through ICT. So, uh, I think the uh, ICT is going to be a kind of catalyst for the changing the world. And we are seeing that power. And today, I want to share my thoughts and our thoughts around that. Um, this is also how we are reaching to seven themes. And the uh, right hand side, we are talking about uh, mega trends. And uh, they are talking about what kind of issues we are facing now, right now, and what ki kind of issues we are going to face in the future. And uh, when we are talking about the seven themes, the all seven themes are connected to each other and to solve or tackle these uh, mega trends. And also, uh, when you are looking at the seven themes, and the uh, top four is uh, talking about uh, smart city, actually. And uh, bottom two are talking about, I, I believe that uh, it's an uh, 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 innovation uh, ecosystem. So for me, it's really, really connected each other. And if we can combine these, and it uh, works very effectively. And so, my proposal or my idea is we have to think about these two in the same context. Hmm. And in that sense, it works very well. I want to share and the, what we are doing around the world and uh, in the area of the smart city. And you know that smart city is a kind of buzzword and that they are talking about smart city in a different nature, different context. And we are working on the various type of smart city, but it is uh, pretty much different from each one. Okay, and one is talking about uh, water leakage, one is talking about uh, transportation, one is talking about poverty, one is talk talking about digital divide. But I'm fine, I'm fine. That is uh, contributing the improvement of uh, uh, life, people's life. So I want to share a couple of things. This is uh, talking about uh, uh, the uh, video surveillance and uh, the Tigre in Argentina. That's a nice city, beautiful city, and uh, near to Buenos Aires. And uh, they had uh, some problems about uh, crime rate and uh, increasing crime rate. And we help, we worked together with a mayor who are very aggressive and importing the uh, behavior detections and the facial recognitions and the license plate recognitions. Surprisingly, they achieved 40% decrease in the number of car stolen or the crime rate. And while the neighboring cities are increasing uh, their crime rate. Second, is, uh, this is a kind of uh, uh, the case in the New Zealand Wellington. And uh, this case, uh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, this case, they had some problem in uh, very wise uh, the uh, uh, city planning and because they couldn't figure out the, what is the uh, traffic rate and what kind of cars and automobiles are moving around 24 hours and 365 days. And uh, we helped them to 
detect all the things by uh, introducing video analytics and also sensors so that uh, they are getting a higher quality of data source and uh, renew out the result in the long term cost saving uh, planning. And the third one, uh, this is a, li a little bit similar to the Boho, uh, the uh, cases. And the, they want to improve economy and life equality and promote uh, the nationwide broadband network. So uh, uh, we help them to uh, set up the ICT rooms and schools and the community centers and called a kiosk BB Digital. And also we help them to uh, serve uh, educational courses. So nearly every Colombian now has access to ICT and the full participation in uh, life as a digital citizen. And uh, uh, they are enjoying and the better opportunities of a uh, job. So in the essence, I want to convey the three things. One is that the innovation ecosystem and the smart city uh, have moved to the reality phase. And we want uh, to uh, synchronize these two things. And ICT is now, it's a really, really powerful catalyst for the sustainable development. And I always facing and, uh, issues and uh, vision and the leadership, especially of uh, policy maker, is uh, very important. Without that, uh, we cannot do anything. And lastly, I just want to share one an interesting example and how the like, uh, uh, public and the private sector cooperate in the one direction, uh, helped by proper uh, policy. And uh, this is a case of Tokyo and they uh, uh, set the target of reducing 30% of greenhouse gases and 38% energy consumptions. And they uh, picked up very interesting a kind of uh, uh, key element, that is the data center. So uh, they promoted and uh, large corporation to uh, follow the eco-friendly DC certifications. And uh, for the small, medium uh, uh, companies, and uh, they incentivize them to uh, be crowdized those uh, services on those large corporations' data center. The, the result is amazing, and 19%, 90% of large facilities now outperformed, and over 30,000 the small and mid-sized facilities now on the cloud. So they really achieved that the both like industrializing and also the uh, eco-efficient. So uh, my last uh, 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 message is an uh, organic link between innovation ecosystem and the smart city. I think this is very important. And engagement, increased engagement between the public and the private, that is also uh, the encouraged. And I think and the CSIS and also other international institutes have to share their experiences, especially at the, the success cases and the failure cases. We see a lot of uh, uh, use cases that is benefiting for everybody. That's uh, the end of my speech. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm going to ask uh, Victor Mulas, who's the program lead for the Innovation Acceleration Program at the World Bank, to to share some of his perspectives. If you, I don't know if you brought up if you brought a pen to a PowerPoint fight or not, or. <laughs> So if, if you want to do it from there, that's okay as well? Or I thought it was going to be faster, so that's I didn't good. prepare presentation. Uh, so happily enough, it will be shorter. Okay, <laughs> fine. Last one. So uh, we'll try to go there. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I, I read the, uh, the report. It was very interesting. I think it's, it's very good to have reports that highlight these issues of innovation ecosystems and, and fab labs for development. I mean, uh, we are seeing the literature, but it's uh, very 
very comforting having uh, partners like JICA pushing for that. Uh, I also want to um, appreciate that you were mentioning the, the projects of the World Bank there, uh, particularly uh, Georgia and Bulgaria that, that were mentioned. Uh, and also, I don't know how you get that information, but uh, I don't know how you uh, could uh, know how everything started in the bank with the Fab Labs, which was going to, uh, to the Fab 10 <coughs> and a group of five TTLs, TTLs are project managers in the bank, just participating there uh, in Barcelona and with, uh, with a group of USAID, actually. Uh, so we were like, uh, just a group of people thinking about that, but didn't know what to do with it and, and connect it. And, and thanks also to the USA, we started working together. And that's how everything started uh, by the end. So uh, we also connected with the, uh, the person from the Bohol uh, Fab Lab. Uh, that was the volunteer that was there with the Bohol government. Uh, so very, very interesting that you could say that in the report. So thank you for, for all that. Um, so I, I wanted to... Uh, uh, to focus my, uh, my remarks on the uh, innovation ecosystems particularly because I, I think the Fab Labs can be part of it and as you say, can be a catalyzer, it's, it's a good instrument. Um, and how the World Bank is, is seeing this or at least uh, how our research is seeing this. And, and from now on, I'm gonna say these remarks on my personal capacity, not on the World Bank because before that I have to pass like uh, probably 20 reviews and, and before I can speak with you. So you're, you're putting on your personal hat. Yes, exactly. So please bear in mind that this is my, my, uh, okay. my opinion. But uh, what we are seeing right now is I think, and we agree there is a moment of economic transformation that is happening and that is affecting everything from companies that uh, are seeing competition emerging from startups uh, and needing to uh, transform themselves the movement to open innovation from the uh, uh, from, from, from corporations, but also from governments, and that's a that's a good sign because now we're changing the way we are seeing problems, and trying to bring all the stakeholders to the solution. Uh, and I think that's 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 an important moment. Now, four years ago, we started to see, or it was four or five years ago, we started to see like the boom of mobile apps. Everything started with that, the startups. And what we started to see at the bank is that this could be a good opportunity for developing countries. Until now, being an entrepreneur in a developing country, you had a lot of barriers that were structural. You have transportation barriers, doing business barriers, uh, regulation. Suddenly, uh, an entrepreneur in a uh, developing country, if they had internet connection, which it was starting to be affordable, could develop an app, put it in, a, uh, in the Google or Apple store, and suddenly generate business and revenue for, for that person right away, overcoming all the barriers. And that was a game changer for entrepreneurship. That's where we started to think, oh, maybe there is something here we can do. And we started experimenting in doing projects supporting uh, uh, entrepreneurship ecosystems. At that time, it was mobile internet ecosystems. We were thinking like that, but at the end, it ended up being tech startup ecosystems. And moving uh, further to today, uh, we've been working in several projects. Uh, the bank has developed a portfolio on this. And we started to do research uh, or to understand better what is behind this and what is the, the real impact, if any, for the goals we are looking for, which is reduction of poverty. And, and we look at employment generation and, and economic growth. Um, so we didn't do this alone. We've been doing this with the partners of the Global Entrepreneurship Research Network, which is also part of the report you mentioned of accelerators. So I think it's another group that is working there because it's all about these areas. And, and we are also working with cities to crowdsource data of their ecosystems because most of the, the, the ecosystems we are seeing are in cities. So um, we started uh, particularly very interested in working with New York City. And the reason for that is because it went from almost non-existing startup ecosystem to be the second largest in the US, which probably is in the world. And they did that since 2008. Now, the interesting thing about New York City, and this is their data, is that in those, day, in those years, they generated about 50,000 employment directly on startups. Well, that's not bad. It's 1% of the working population. But it's more interesting that if you look at it, they generated 150,000 additional jobs in traditional industries that other tech jobs. Many of those were the factor of these startups making disruptive technologies on uh, traditional industries in New York. So media, finance, advertising. And because they target that, those companies have to respond. So think about an Uber entering your city and you're a taxi company, you need to hire a, a, someone to do the mobile app. So think about all these industries. That is when you start talking about generation of employment at a larger level. 
Now, the other interesting factor that we saw there is 44% of those jobs require skills below bachelor's degree. And that, for me, it's a game changer for the developing countries. Because that means that you maybe don't need such big skills to start developing this uh, employment. For sure, you need the white collar entrepreneurs that develop the startups, but then apparently there's a long tail of blue collar tech skills, and then the bootcamp center and all this vocational training. Uh, but those are the, uh, the effects we were looking into. So having that in mind, we start saying like, okay, but how do you do a, a startup ecosystem? And we were seeing that they were emerging in cities because of agglomeration effects. You go now to Mumbai, you go to Sao Paulo, there are startups, right? You, you see them everywhere. Uh, but uh, how, uh, what makes them the kickstart of this ecosystem and what makes them be sustainable? So we start looking at all the elements and usually in every ecosystem you have uh, four elements that everybody repeats in the literature. Human capital, economic assets that include from finance to the companies that are there, universities, infrastructure of course, and the business environment. Um, what we found out is all of these elements need to be connected somehow. And that is what we are seeing is happening now. It's what we call networking assets. And that is what includes from the meetups and the events that happen for entrepreneurs to meet each other, to find each other and connect with each other. The collaboration spaces, uh, the fab labs or the maker spaces where they build communities of people connecting with each other. Accelerators and incubators, we've seen that they have a, a, a big role because they develop mentors networks and also connect you with uh, talent and resources. Uh, that could be seed investment later, and angels and venture capital. Now, what we did is to collect data of several uh, of these ecosystems. And we started with New York doing this research, and we collected data directly from startups. So we have data from around 600 of the startups, and we started understanding how these connections were, and analyzing where was the source of these connections. And our findings was that these networking assets, and we use accelerators for the proxy, were central to the ecosystem. So translating it directly, they are the glue that makes the sustainability of these ecosystems. Um, now, the second thing we, we were thinking about is, well, networking assets are important to connect these actors socially, but how important is the social dimension for startups to be successful? And what we found is that uh, it matters. It correlates positively with success in terms of receiving uh, funding. Now we want to think about, well, what about the geographic dimension? Because many of the people say, no, you just have to put them together. Well, the reality is there's zero correlation. So it is not about geographic dimension, it's about social dimension. So mm. that is a very important finding for us because every time we go to uh, a city or a country, not only they want the Silicon Valley for the country, yeah. they also want an innovation district, apparently, or a tech park. Apparently that's, that's a new thing. Everybody wants their innovation district. And, and I had this conversation with an American city and said, like, well, that's fantastic for urban regeneration, but how are the people going to connect? You are, you are doing new buildings and putting universities and, and companies, but do they connect somehow? So if you don't have this social dimension, these events, these cafes, these uh, uh, co collaboration spaces, or even these fab labs can be sometimes those collaboration spaces between companies and universities, but you force them with a program, that connection doesn't happen. And you can see that uh, in, in many different environments. It's very interesting because the report mentions uh, Boston. And one of the things we look in Boston, and this is uh, Talia Kaufman Research, but who has collaborated with us, is Boston decided to create an innovation district. It's around the harbor. Forget about M M Cambridge, because that's a different animal with MIT and Harvard. So, but in Boston itself, they wanted to do this innovation district. And they did the traditional thing create a new area in the harbor, we are regenerating new buildings, amazing glass buildings, we're going to put there the, the, the universities and, and companies. But when you map where the entrepreneurs are, nobody's there. They are all in downtown, where the bars are and the amenities are and everything. <laughs> so <laughs> they forgot to build the bars in the... Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Well, my, my you got to build the innovation centers in the bars. That's the point. And, and, and that is what I told the, these guys in Latin America. So like, stop thinking that they are going to come to you. Go to them. And it's easier to build things in the soft way and then uh, seeing how do you create these collaboration spaces and so on within the urban environments where people will naturally connect and, and, and do that. So, so that was uh, also interesting. And, and, and then the other part that we have is that we need to look at ecosystems from the policy perspective. We are going to support them uh, to catalyze private sector. We have to look at them from the uh, systematic approach, not only just parts of it, right? 
So that's where we can see into uh, skills pipeline, finance pipeline, the community and the space uh, pipeline. Then the business environment and the infrastructure matters, but it matters relatively uh, for creating the ecosystem. It matters more for maturing it, for, <coughs> for the companies to become SMEs. And the last thing, just to, uh, to point, because I, I saw the, uh, the, the findings of the report from Gali and Accelerator, and then the recommendation in the report about connecting with uh, international, uh, uh, international expertise or more material expertise. The second thing we are doing right now, we haven't published this, but we are working on it, is we have uh, six cities, and we are comparing five of them are in developing countries, so they are less mature, the ecosystem against New York, which is the more mature one. When you see an ecosystem maturing, it does the S, exponential growth and then the S. The other ones are still linear or, or growing, right, in terms of startups. And we wanted to find out uh, how can you kick a start or maintain an ecosystem. And the first thing we find out is that incubators and startups can kick start an ecosystem if you don't have enough agglomeration effects. And that's important because when you go to rural areas, you cannot make it by itself. You don't have the numbers. There's no agglomeration. But these fab labs, incubators, and accelerators can help you kick a start. They produce a uh, quantity uh, of these startups. Uh, and that's, for instance, Medellin has 2 million inhabitants versus Cairo or Santiago de Chile or Bogota that are talking about the 6 million to 7 million. Medellin can have the same level of startups than the others uh, per capita. And the reason is, is that. But the other thing we saw is, well, this is good for quantity, but what about quality? And that's important for sustainability. Are we creating startups just for, for creating startups, or are we creating startups that are sustainable, that will be competitive internationally and generate employment and grow? And what we saw is we look at uh, the startups that uh, were incubated or accelerated, we, we look at the likelihood of getting funding. And we said, uh, what happens in New York versus these other uh, 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 cities? And what happens is basically if you go on incubator and accelerator in New York, you have the same likelihood of getting funding. It doesn't matter uh, if you go to incubator accelerator or if, if you are outside. In these other countries or those other ecosystems that are not mature, you have two or three times more chances to get funding if you go to this incubator accelerator. Mm. So obviously you have, to, you have to go there. It's creating this quantity. But then we ask, of those that got funded, uh, going or not going, how much did you get? Uh, if you were going to an accelerator. In New York, it was two times. If you go to an accelerator and incubator. So those guys that go to an accelerator and incubator in New York are quality startups. They are rewarded by twice more funding, right? And the others, zero. Mm -hmm. So we're telling you it's more about uh, quantity at this point. They are not getting that quality yet. Uh, so that's important because one of the things we see in these ecosystems is that these uh, fab labs or accelerators and incubators are being created by very enthusiastic people, but they don't know what they are doing, really. Uh, they only know the, the basics. And to know what you are doing, you need to uh, have more maturity or having the experience. So bringing that expertise, for instance, by bringing a, a tech stars or one of these leading accelerators into your country and helping developing the, the maturity of that support infrastructure is key to for the sustainability. Um, and the last thing just uh, uh, to see is in, in the Fab Lab, you have different models that it's important to look at. Uh, I like that you have maker spaces that allow you to be more flexible. You don't have so many requirements at the Fab Lab. That's all, all the thing to look for rural areas. And then you even have models for uh, industrial incubators. I visited one in Malaga in Spain that was just like a normal incubator, but it has like these uh, industrial little spaces that were given to people that at the end they were doing their mini Fab Lab for their enterprise. And the important thing that they had there that I thought it was very interesting is they provided them uh, not only electricity and what they needed, but all the municipal licenses they needed for an activity that was industrial huh. that can take you for a year or two years to get in some space. So that's a good really interesting model that would be uh, interesting to add here. Uh, Thank you. Okay, so let me ask a couple questions. Your audience has been very patient, but I want to put a couple questions to this group. So. Uh, I know that if you are resident in the Research Triangle in North Carolina, or if you're Ann Mae Chang, or you're Victor at uh, the World Bank, you get the question of how do I copy paste and get a Research Triangle? Or I want, it, could the World Bank, I'd like the World Bank to pay for a new Silicon Valley and just copy paste it or 
you go to Anne May or they go to JICA and they say, we really want a Silicon Valley. Can you guys just, you know, just make that happen, push a button and make that happen? So I'd like each of the four of you to respond to the issue of, can you just make one of these magically appear? I think that's, that's a fairly leading question, but I'd be curious, of, I'd ask you to respond to that. And then I'd like each of you to talk about uh, the issue of, does innovation equal technology? Is innovation the same thing as technology? Are we conflating innovation and technology? I think some of the, the presentations here did a very nice job of sort of dis disentangling that, but I think it's important, I think, that we unpack the issue of innovation and, and, and how, how it relates to technology, because as I think implied in the presentations and in all of your remarks, that they're, they're different, but I think it would be interesting to unpack that. Um, uh, so let me, uh, let me start you, with you, Dr. Rieger, first. So in terms of, uh, let me start with the second yeah. one, innovation is equal yeah. uh, technology or not? Oh, well, it isn't equal, but it's pretty close. Uh, and, and the reason I say that is that there's always an element of technology in it, even if it turns out to be not the decisive element or not the most crucial element of it. Uh, case in point, um, a number of years ago, most of the Silicon Valley companies were uh, innovating and disrupting technologies. Today, by and large, they are disrupting businesses and business models. And sometimes you need some new technology to do that, and sometimes you don't. Uh, the very popular uh, model of Uber is a disruptive business model to a part of the industry that has got to do with transportation and cabs and taxis. The technology part of that does exist. It's an app that does, uh, or application uh, running on a server on, on smartphones. It does things that are needed for that, so without it you could not do the innovation. But it is, and this I am saying not, that's not disrespect, but it's not rocket science. Uh, and it's not a disruptive technology of any kind. Uh, one can create that application without much further ado. Uh, uh, my point is there that you need some technology, therefore it's related, but it's not the point and it's not the centerpiece and not, it's not what uh, uh, um, the startups concentrate on. Uh, but, uh, but they are trying to change business models and, and eliminate business models and introduce new ones, and that's the more important part of it. As we go down the road, there will be more and more of these. Uh, that doesn't mean that there will be not new uh, uh, technologies available, but we can do, as I emphasized in uh, my short address, is that we, with existing technologies, we could already quite probably reinvent half of the businesses that we have. Well, I think, I think that point, I think, is something for us to understand that it's not just a, that this new technological wave, as you were saying, isn't just going to impact the developed world. It's going to have massive impacts on business models in the developing world, and it could have all sorts of upside, but it may also have a lot of social dislocation. Indeed, and, and what it also does, uh, we haven't touched upon that uh, yet uh, today, is that the so-called developed world has a learning curve. We were trying to put together models and financial models and business models and, and so on, and we learned how to get there, but we were meandering a little bit. Now that the, uh, the world that we are trying to help in uh, <coughs> international development and some developed countries don't need that road. They don't need to follow. We know already where we would like to get, and the modern technology helps them to get right there without making the mistakes that we have made already. Yeah. MA, so innovation equal technology? So I would actually tease those two apart more. Um, you know, it, especially in the developing world, um, we've seen dramatic, uh, to me what matters about innovation is that you're achieving um, better results for lower cost. You know, mm -hmm. that if you're able to dramatically decrease cost and increase impact, that's what innovation is about. Technology is a tool that sometimes can help you achieve those goals, and certainly transformative technologies have made it easier to achieve those goals in some cases. But we see, especially in development, innovations that involve no new technology. We were, uh, we were talking earlier mm. about a project we support um, with, that involves chlorine dispensers, which is basically a bucket that has a button on it, so 
not any fancy technology at all, um, that allows people to put chlorine in their jerry can when they go to the point of community water distribution. And this has increased usage of chlorine by 10x, from 5% to 50%. Um, and you know, saved countless lives and cases of diarrhea, but very, very simple technology. I think one of the reasons um, that we connect the two is that in the developed world, um, we've seen some huge technology revolutions recently with the advent of smartphones, the internet, and so forth. And so there is more space to explore with these new technologies that has not been explored yet. An Uber could not have been done without it, even though it's not just a technology um, solution. There's just a lot more um, space to explore with these technologies. In developing countries, a lot of the space without these technologies has not still been fully explored, and so there's a lot more room there. And what we see, off, what I see often is, as a technologist working in developing countries, is that um, often for people who don't come from a technology background, there's an excitement about technology and the potential for technology and a leap to technology being the solution. Whereas a lot of times if you're, for example, trying to get information out to farmers or health information out to people, broadcasting over community radio is a much more effective way than texting that information to people who may, half of which who may be illiterate. Um, and so we need mm. to look at the appropriate technology for the problem you're trying to solve. Great. So does technology equal innovation? Oh, I, I think uh, I wanted to say yes, but uh, I think it's not enough. It could be a catalyst, it could be accelerator, and uh, it could be a, a kind of uh, uh, driver for the, the changing the game. But you need a player with a passion. You need a leadership to uh, realize that happens. So I think it's not enough. So uh, simple technology uh, uh, doesn't change anything. You need a player. OK, so Victor, I want to go to my first question to you, which is you must have many people knocking on your door and say, OK, now I want a research triangle park from North Carolina. I want to copy paste that. And I want to put that in Santiago, Chile. Or I want to put that in Dar es Salaam. Or how do I, I want to, you must have literally once a week, you must have someone say, what I really need is I need a Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley in Kigali. So can you, World Bank, make that happen for me? So if someone says that to you, what is your response in terms of, uh, A, I'm sure you could say, well, well I can kind of help, but, there's, but I, I, what I'd like you to do is talk about sort of what are the, what are the elements for you to have a, a, a thing that walks and quacks like a Silicon Valley? An innovation ecosystem. What's it take to create an inno what's it? What are you going to need to have an innovation ecosystem? Yeah. So the answer is yes, that happens continuously. This um, happens continuously, yeah, correct? And, right. Um, the first uh, answer that I have th that I give them is you probably want to have a New York, not a Silicon Valley, because uh, you can replicate many of the things that happen in New York, but Silicon Valley is going to be much more difficult. And the reason is uh, uh, in New York, you can see that most how the city use its strength and adapt it uh, whatever they have there to develop their uh, home ground uh, startup ecosystem right so the idea is can we look first at what what do you look like what do you have what are the strengths that you have uh, uh, that you can leverage and every, everywhere you have something right so i like the first recommendation of the report which starts with map your e innovation ecosystem and first I have to say that it's, there's a difference between innovation and entrepreneurship here. So uh, that's something that first you need to, to figure out what do they want exactly. But I think in mapping there, that's where you're going to find the gaps. And after you find the gaps uh, or, and the things you can leverage is when you can start bringing, oh, look, this is what they did in Amsterdam. This is what they did in Nairobi. This is what they did in Santiago. You can start giving them options of how to address those gaps and, and connect uh, what is missing and leverage those other things. So for instance, when we work in Beirut, in Lebanon, uh, they, have, they have a lot of things that are very good. They have uh, probably the, the, the best educated young population in the Middle East. Uh, they are exporting it. So how do you retain it? So in that case, you have a specific problem there. It's an opportunity, but it's also a, a problem. Uh, but at the same time, they have very robust creative industries. Uh, can you use that to leverage entrepreneurship and, and connect the two of them together? Can you use the banking industry to start developing mini ecosystems of fintech? Um, so the idea is look at what they have and uh, how do you can explore things. On the other hand, for instance, in Lebanon, you couldn't move mm. politically anything because the country is very 
politically doesn't have a government for long periods of time. So how do you operate in those environments? Uh, what can you do with those uh, strengths and weaknesses? Every place we go, we, we have to do that. So the first part is we spend at least the first two to four weeks just learning about the ecosystem in a very detailed way. We ask everyone inside, we start to meet uh, every single actor, and then come back with, okay, this is what we see, and these are the gaps that we can find. Um, we then try to tell them that Silicon Valley might not be what they want, that they have to create their own whatever it is uh, and adapt it to them. So it's kind of changing the equation. But yes, they continue wanting the brand. I mean, you have a very good brand in the US with Silicon Valley. Let's open it up. Love to hear, there's some thoughtful people with, with ideas here. I want to hear from this gentleman here. Other, let's bounce this together. We'll do this World Bank style. We'll get several points. This gentleman here. Anybody else? I don't know, they can take it. One more. Okay. Then I will just do over these two. Hello. Name thank and who you, what organization you're with. Yes. Hello. Uh, my name is Dan Vasquez. I'm CEO of uh, IntelliWings International Relations Consulting. Uh, my question to the panel is, uh, how do you overcome some of the local cultural resistance to innovation? For example, William Saito, who is the uh, cybersecurity advisor to the Prime Minister of Japan, said that um, the, the most innovative people are typically in their mid to late 20s. But in a country like Japan, the problem he's facing with cybersecurity is that uh, the 20-somethings the in Japan are expected to defer all important decisions and innovation to the 40-somethings and 50-somethings and 60-somethings. So how do you uh, overcome that cultural resistance to innovation when innovation is so important and is often done by the, the younger generation. Thank you. Well, I'm going to defer that to Dr. Catano, but also I'd love to hear from uh, maybe uh, Marita san if you want to respond to that as well, I'd be interested. Uh, I think it's uh, always uh, difficult and uh, the challenging. And uh, so uh, the, a lot of the, uh, the uh, uh, management of large corporation trying to facilitate like uh, 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 a working environment, uh, which is uh, like uh, uh, very friendly uh, for the people, and uh, the especially for the young people. So uh, uh, I think uh, giving the challenging uh, the uh, tasks is uh, much more important than like uh, compensations or others. And uh, working environment and the challenging tasks. I think those two are the important things mm -hmm. for them to be uh, attracted. D Dr. Katana, do you want to answer that or respond to that? Let me give you a microphone. Let me get a microphone to Dr. Katana. You know what? You want to pass? Okay. Can I? Okay, I was going to say, Dr. Rieger, you want to comment on this too? <coughs> You're with Fujitsu. Can I turn this around a little bit because I, I don't think this is a specifically Japanese problem. This is a problem of hierarchical organizational structures. And the World Bank is a hierarchical organizational structure. And, and what I didn't have time to say, uh, that digital, I said digital destroys business models and, and so on. But I didn't say uh, digital transformation destroys hierarchies as well. And, and the way we build large scale organizations across the world, in any country, in any culture, does not correspond well to what you need if you are in the digital transformation and, and, and disruptive innovation phase. Because what you need is very short path lengths to anyone, including the president. Of an organization. Of an organization. And I don't know, you know your organization is probably not that large. Uh, and I'm not going to pick up on my current organization, so but you let's just say one that. of, your, the, one of those, some of the fast. Tech when I used to work for IBM, right. yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> that's when, a good I, one. When, I, when I used to work for IBM 20 some years ago, there were eight layers of hierarchy between me and the CEO. Okay, now that thing cannot exist in the de uh, days of digital transformation and disruptive innovation and innovation ecosystems. We need to have much flatter organizations, direct access, uh, quick reaction to any question and fast decisions, and this is an organizational issue. Anyone, wanna, anyone else want to comment on this? You don't have to. Okay, the other, the other gentleman here. 
Hi, Kishore Rao from Deloitte Consulting. I just wanted to share a perspective and get a reaction, which is in our commercial business, we're finding more and more multinationals, especially American multinationals, turning to the crowd and turning to connectivity, connection with startups and enterprises around the world as a way of solving business problems. So originally it started out, like Anne May was saying, around open innovation using challenges and challenge type of mechanisms. But now they're fi we're finding more and more of our clients are looking at, at a new way of doing their R&D around the world. And they're looking for startups, for enterprises in different countries uh, to partner with and eventually perhaps uh, take over or have strategic uh, alliances with as a way of accelerating the, the uh, development of R&D and technology and commercialization time to market. And it's a huge force. Um, so it is definitely not geographic, it is really transnational. I'm just wondering if you see the same thing in all the panelists and how do you, how do you harness some of this in, in your ways of thinking? Would you want to comment on that, Maurice? Uh, um, yeah, definitely. And uh, uh, nobody uh, can fulfill and buy alone, right? And even IBM, or even the Cisco, even anyone and cannot. So uh, uh, I think uh, we have to be uh, uh, taking into the consideration that always we are ready for the, some partnering and uh, in any kind of forms. And uh, so uh, uh, I think that's, that's why and uh, everybody are talking about uh, like ecosystems and so forth in a whatever format. So uh, I think uh, in order to deliver like uh, a more social uh, value. And uh, we definitely have to partner with somebody who knows like applications and the services and so forth. And the application, the service uh, providers and uh, cannot be facilitated for the technology, which is uh, uh, bringing the value to, or uh, improving the value of the, all the services. So definitely that uh, services and uh, application side have to be tied with the technology providers. Technology provider have to be tied with like uh, services and uh, applications and the people who knows the how to the business goals. That's I, I think I feel, and uh, uh, especially and uh, 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 upper side upper layers is uh, really uh, depending on the cultural things and. Uh, uh, so forces. So I think that we definitely, if we are going to do a business around world, and uh, you need to have a very good local partners mm -hmm. in some ways. Dr. Ryu, could you just respond to that? I'd be curious what you what your reaction is to that. And question. I know why you're asking. I, uh, know, I live exactly. in Germany working for a Japanese yeah. company and now here in the States. <laughs> and uh, uh, my response to that is that uh, partnering is essential because there's no time to create all the parts of a value chain for any one company. And so partnering is essential, but what is also essential is uh, the creation of platforms. And currently in the digital transformation IoT activities around the world, I'm starting to get worried about when IoT I IoT is Internet of Things. Uh, Internet of Things, right. Internet of Things, I'm trying to get worried about how the uh, European companies are trying to create their own platform for interoperability, how the American companies uh, don't really worry about what the Europeans are doing because they have their own thing, and how Japan is uh, sometimes <coughs> thinking that well, we are going to do on our own thing for the, for, the, for the cause of innovation on digital platforms, uh, this is not good. What we need is a single platform. What we need is good standards, open standards, where everybody can dock in. I can prove to you, not here, but at the time is, uh, is not sufficient, but I can prove to you that in any development, the early creation of an open platform speeded up the development, engaged more people, and created a larger market than any one of these efforts could have. Okay, we're going to end it here. Please join me in thanking the panel and our presentation.